Welcome back to this exciting episode of the Reverse Alzheimer's Summit. I'm so thrilled and absolutely delighted to introduce you to Dr. Mark Hyman. He's a leading health revolution expert. He has revolved his expertise around using food as medicine to support longevity, energy, mental clarity, happiness, and so much more. Dr. Hyman is a practicing family physician and an internationally recognized leader, speaker, educator, and advocate in the field of functional medicine. He is the founder and director of the Ultra Wellness Center, the head of strategy and innovation of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, and a 14-time New York Times bestselling author, and board president for clinical affairs for the Institute for Functional Medicine. He is also the host of one of the leading health podcasts, The Doctor's Pharmacy. Dr. Hyman is a regular medical contributor on several television shows and networks, including CBS This Morning, Today, Good Morning America, The View, and CNN. He's also an advisor and guest co-host on The Dr. Oz Show. Dr. Hyman, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So you have taken on a lot in your career. And one of the things that I'm most excited to chat about is this big idea that it's the food system that we need to fix in order to address our the, the root cause of our health uh, as a society. So th this mm. is a massive problem and mm -hmm. a massive undertaking, and yet you've taken it on. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Well, I mean, maybe <laughs> I feel like Don Quixote yelling at windmills, but <laughs> I think it needs to be done because our food system from end to end is both the cause and the cure for most of the problems that we're facing today in the world. And I just want to sort of list them and, and how I came to understand this, but really first started by me sitting in my office with patients, realizing that I could not cure diabetes in my office, that it was cured on the farm. It was cured uh, in the grocery store. It was cured in the restaurants. It was cured in the kitchen and the workplace. And I could not fix my patients if I didn't deal with the upstream causes. And I began to think about, well, what, what's causing the food system that we have? Uh, and it really was our food policies. And then I began to look at what, what causes our food policies? Well, it's, it's the food companies and the food industry that's driving so many of those policies through massive amounts of lobbying. And then I began to realize that the other side was not being heard. And I, and I started a nonprofit, 501c3, the Food Fix Campaign, and an advocacy group, a 501c4 lobby group, to try to change that. And for example, this morning, I was on a call with my lobby team in Washington because we're trying to push for medical schools to build into the curriculum nutrition education and chronic disease. It's, it's the single biggest cause of chronic disease and the single biggest cure, and yet doctors know nothing about it. My daughter's in medical school right now, and she's like, Dad, we don't get any nutrition education. And, and, and so we're trying, for example, to figure out how to, how to mandate on the licensing exams, nutrition and chronic disease questions, which will force the curriculums to shift in both undergraduate and postgraduate medical education. That's just sort of one example. So I began to sort of look at the problem as a whole and realize that you know, how we grow food um, drives the food that's consumed and the food that's consumed is driving the diseases we see and the costs associated with it. So now we have six out of 10 Americans with a chronic disease. We have 88% of Americans with some form of prediabetes. That's just a mind boggling number. Almost nine out of 10 Americans have metabolic poor health. Uh, that economic burden is staggering. One out of five dollars in our economy is spent on healthcare, and probably eighty to ninety percent is on chronic disease that's caused by food. Uh, and then, and then you have that economic burden on society and, and governments and in America, for example, on corporations. Uh, I think Warren Buffett said that healthcare is the sort of parasite of business because of the cost of healthcare. Uh, and, then, and then we have other downstream consequences that are, have to do with health inequities, social justice issues, the effect on kids and learning, mental health. I mean, I, I just uh, talked to a friend of mine who's uh, the psychiatrist at McLean Harvard, who just wrote a new book about uh, the brain called Brain Energy, which is coming out in the fall, where he discovered that by changing the diet in one of his schizophrenic patients to help him lose weight using a ketogenic diet, his schizophrenia went away. And it just kind of lit the light bulb for him that, wait a minute, the brain and food are connected and we may need to sort of rethink the whole paradigm of mental health and even uh, neurodegenerative diseases, which I know we're really focused on with reversing uh, uh, Alzheimer's. And, yeah. and then and just a couple other points, you know, and, and then in terms of some of our big issues around climate and the environment, 
uh, we see we see the food system, uh, you know, not really as a big part of that, but in fact, it is probably the single biggest cause of, of climate change, environmental destruction through agriculture, because of the way we grow food is, is, is destroying the soil. The soil is a carbon sink. In fact, a third of all the carbon in the atmosphere comes from the soil being degraded over the last 150 years through tillage and chemical use that destroys the living matter of the soil. We, 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 we really look end to end at the food system from food waste to deforestation to the inputs from oil. And we're, we're really facing the challenge of this right now because we have an oil dependent food system that, that now uh, is, is, being, is being challenged because of the rising oil prices because of the war in Ukraine. And we're seeing global food shortages. We're seeing developing countries not be able to afford the food because as the price of oil goes up, the price of commodities goes up like corn and soy and wheat, right? So they're all dependent on oil inputs. And so you're seeing now 20 plus million people in, in Africa being at risk for starvation. So these are all interconnected problems and we have to think of them as one whole problem. When we think about Alzheimer's, it, it's similar in that it's a complex problem without a solution that matches the complexity of the problem. Yeah. And as I hear you talk about the food system, right? This it's this very interconnected, very complex problem that requires a complex solution. Mm -hmm. And so as we sort of dive into how this affects the brain, you know. The, again, the interconnectedness, we need the wisdom of our elders at the height of their wisdom and experience. If they mm -hmm. don't yeah. have that con cognitive function to, yeah. uh, to uh, contribute that intergenerational wisdom, then we will not find solutions to the world's biggest problems. Right. And so uh, having these conversations and starting to think about how we can harness and protect that cognitive function is essential. Yeah. Um, I think, and I'm, I, we clearly are on the same page. So let's talk about some tangible things that people can do, the decisions that they can make at home that have that ripple effect, not only the effect on them personally in terms of better cognitive function, mm -hmm. less diabetes, better mental health, more energy, better sleep, you know, the list, I love it because the side effects of like a Bredesen protocol or the Pegan diet or, or mm -hmm. Dr. Perlmutter's approach, right, all of our, our colleagues in this space, is that the side effect is that everything gets better. Every yeah. cell in the body <laughs> works better. Yeah. And the ripple effects are that we're making better decisions for the planet, better decisions for society. So tell me, what, it, what would you say if somebody could make one decision today that would change their health, what would it be? I mean, that's really easy. Uh, I think, you know, the challenge is, uh, you know, just to kind of like a little side tangent before I answer that question, I, I just came back from Korea, which is one of the blue zones. And I sat with a woman who was 103 years old and she was sharp as a tack. And another couple, the husband was 97, the woman was 87. Uh, and it was really astounding to see the level of health they had, the level of cognitive function they had. And, and, and in looking at their diet, it was just so clear that, that their natural way of moving and living and being through their social connections, through their having to move in terms of their, their, their sort of structural lives of shepherding and gardening and doing the basic tasks kept them active. But the food was really amazing. For example, they drank this wild sage tea that every day that is super high in, in something called epigalactic catechins, which are from green, we see them in green tea, but they have profound effects on, on, our, on our health, on activating longevity switches, anti-inflammatory switches, antioxidant switches, uh, and detoxification switches in the body. And so, so if there was a single thing I would recommend, which would be to, to really re dramatically reduce or even eliminate for the most part, refined sugar and refined carbohydrates. Th those are the things that are driving so much of our problem. And I mentioned earlier that eight out of 10, I'm sorry, almost nine out of 10 Americans have poor metabolic health, which means they have high blood sugar, high blood pressure, or high cholesterol, which are, by the way, all caused by starchy sugar. So we consume about 152 pounds of uh, sugar and about 133 pounds of flour per person per year in America. And, and those are poisons. Uh, those are literally poisons. And, and we think of alcohol as a poison, but in the same way, we, the biggest cause, for example, of liver damage in America is sugar and starch. Fatty liver affects 90 million Americans and, and it drives all the chronic diseases. So we now talk about Alzheimer's as type three diabetes because of this insulin resistance in the brain. So there's a single thing I would do is eliminate liquid sugar calories. And, and you know, yes, you can have sweets from time to time, but, but it should not be a staple in your diet and flour should not be a staple in your diet and sugar should not be a staple in your diet. It's a treat. I think of them as recreational drugs. Occasionally I have a glass of tequila, 
but I don't do it every day and I don't have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> So I think it really helps people to understand a little bit of the historical and political context around the sugar industry and how they influence this narrative that fat was bad, but sugar was an okay replacement. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> yes, that's a rabbit hole. I mean, I, I wrote a whole book about this called Eat Jack Get Thin, and I talked about the history uh, of the belief that it was uh, fat, not sugar, that caused the problem. And it's a long story if you're interested to read that book. But the basic short story is that, that we thought high cholesterol was the problem. We thought cholesterol is caused by eating too much fat and that that was the problem. If we cut fat, we'd cut uh, cholesterol, we'd cut heart disease. This didn't turn out to be so simple. Uh, in fact, the, the thing that causes your liver to manufacture cholesterol is starch and sugar. That's what causes high um, triglycerides, low HDL, small LDL particles, many LDL particles. Those are what we call atherogenic dyslipidemia. In other words, the kind of cholesterol that causes heart disease and, and hardening of the arteries, which happens in your heart, but also in your brain. And a lot of dementia is actually hardening the arteries in the brain, which is caused by the same mechanisms. And so we, we kind of got sidetracked and the government kind of bought that line and the McGovern uh, report in the, in the 1970s tried to, to make an advance on dealing with nutrition and disease, but they, they were influenced highly by uh, experts at the time who were, were pushing the notion that fat was the problem. And so we were told to eat less fat and eat more carbohydrates. And the, the food pyramid said eat six to 11 servings of bread, rice, cereal, and pasta and fat sparingly, which was sort of the upside down of what we should be doing. And now you see, you know, the, uh, the for example, uh, the, the, uh, the groups like Berta Health, which is a sort of outside of healthcare, uh, using ketogenic diets to reverse diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, 60% of diabetes gets reversed in advanced diabetics. And I've seen this over and over in my practice. Uh, and we see uh, you know, them, them actually using 70% of their diet as fat. And, and this is not necessarily good for everybody, but for those with really poor metabolic health, you know, using a higher fat, low carbohydrate diet can be very effective. And, and this is really not my idea. I'm, I'm a practicing doctor. I'm not a, a research scientist, but my colleagues like David Ludwig at Harvard have done really the hard work and published, you know, pro really profound research looking at how, for example, taking identical calorie diets, but swapping out the, the fat and carbohydrates, you know, those who eat the, the high fat, low carbohydrate diets, high buff, uh, higher metabolism, burn 400 calories more a day, lose more weight. So it's not about calories in, calories out. It's about the information in food. And that's really the foundation of functional medicine is understanding that food is information, not just calories. That it's instructions or code. And it regulates every single function of your biology, from your immune system, to your microbiome, to your hormones, to your detoxification system, to your mitochondrial function, to your, what you're made out of your structural system. So all of it is really connected to food. It is the most powerful lever we have to change. And, and we really got it pretty wrong. I mean, you look at the, the historical shift in obesity, and I think the government, is just, it just caught us by surprise. And even doctors are kind of still not very aware of this because in the last 30 years, it's been like a hockey stick of obesity and diabetes. And, and, and people are just like, wait, what happened? And it's really because of this, this uh, push towards a high carbohydrate, low fat diet that really drove so much of this problem. And we, I want to just echo that it, over and over again, what I see personally in my clinical practice is people reversing their cognitive decline, reversing diagnosed Alzheimer's when they get on a ketogenic diet. Yeah. And I, one of the things that comes up is this idea that a ketogenic diet can, you know, is it just bacon and eggs and cheese? No, God, so no. <laughs> tell us the pagan, I'm saying pagan, am I saying that right? Yes, pagan, yes. Pagan diet. All right. So you are a proponent of the pagan diet. And I'm so curious, you know, how you describe it, because I know there's a lot of overlap with the ketogenic diet, but a big yeah. emphasis on veggies. Well, well, the whole idea is it is it, 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 it is focus on a few key principles. One is is quality. So what is the quality of the information you're putting in your body? Uh, is it food or is it not food? Most of the stuff we eat is not food. It's highly processed ingredients that are pretty far from what they looked at, looked like when they came off the farm. And the second key principle is food is medicine. So understand that it is, it is literally code or instructions is programming your biology with everybody. And the third is personalization. So not everybody needs a ketogenic diet, but the pecan diet was sort of a, a, a joke basically that I came up with on stage when one doctor was uh, focusing on paleo, one was a vegan cardiologist and they were fighting and I, it was getting kind of heavy. And I'm like, hey, if you're a paleo and you're vegan, I must be pegan. And I sort of made a joke 
and, and it stuck and people laughed and I thought, okay, they wrote an article about it. But essentially it's really focusing on those three key principles. And, and, and depending on where you are in the spectrum of your health, you may need more aggressive treatment, right? And like Benjamin Franklin said, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And sometimes people need a pound of cure. And, and in, 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 the, in certain cases like, you know, type two diabetes, Alzheimer's, autism, schizophrenia, uh, and, and uh, epilepsy and various kinds of neurologic diseases, we see profound effects of ketogenic diets. And, and I think, uh, you know, I just, I just, uh, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but this psychiatrist at Harvard, you know, put this patient on, this, on a ketogenic diet with schizophrenia and cured his schizophrenia because he just changed the metabolic health of his brain. So the brain, you know, it's interesting, psychiatrists pay little attention to the brain and neurologists pay little attention to the mind. <laughs> And so we kind of have to understand that the brain is, is as part of our biology, not like we learned in medical school, that it's this sort of disembodied thing that sits on top of our neck and is disconnected from this, our, the rest of our biology by this thing called the blood brain barrier, which is not really what we now know. It's, a, it, it's very dynamic and everything happens in our brain that happens in our body. So we really have enormous power to pull these levers that Traditional medicine is not pulling, unfortunately. And we're seeing, it just breaks my heart because I see so many people suffering that don't need to suffer. And it doesn't, doesn't mean to say we can cure all Alzheimer's and we can cure all disease, but we just have so much better understanding of the biology now. It's just not, it's just not getting into medical practice. This is such an important point that there's unnecessary suffering happening. And that's what gets me out of bed every day to do yeah. this work is because we can see, we see it with our own eyes every day with our patients. And I know your work is to spread that. How can we increase the impact? There's so much suffering that doesn't need to happen. And particularly okay. with dementia, as we approach this demographic shift, where we're gonna have many, many more elderly folks than we have young people to care for them, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. must find solutions. Prevention, as you mentioned, so much easier than treatment. Our yeah. confidence goes up when we can intervene earlier. So when someone is younger, mm -hmm. earlier in the disease process, and if they can be all in with exercise, diet, sleep, all of these foundational pieces that uh, really are critical to health. So I'm so excited to be joining you sort of in this crusade, maybe shouting into the wind. Um, but I know I've talked to patients who have come in to my office with your book in hand saying, I've got better, I've gotten better. Things are better. I've lost weight. I feel sharper. I feel better. Or Dr. Bredesen's yeah. book, I've, I'm getting yeah. better just from this book. Now, how can yeah. we get the next layer? So thank yeah. you for inspiring people to do that. Now, yeah. you have you seen patients that have reverse dementia and cognitive decline? What sure. are the awesome? I love it. So do you have any quick anecdotes to share? About of course, that? of course. I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. Uh, you know, one was was a really interesting woman, and this was sort of an easy win. Uh, and it just shows the power of nutrition. She was about a, a, a early 80s. She was, uh, you know, a wealthy woman who was on the board of some major companies and uh, running her companies. And it was just was told she had MCI or mild cognitive impairment and just to get her affairs in order and sorry. And I said, well, gee, let's have a look and see what's under the hood. And it turned out she, you know, had severe B12 deficiency, which is not uncommon in the elderly because of low stomach acid and diet and various things. And she had also real problems with methylation and B vitamins, and which is a key part of your cognitive function. And, and so I just gave her B12 shots and I gave her some B vitamins like, uh, that help with methylation, like folate, B6. And, and she was like, boom, back to normal. And then about five years later, I got a call from her. I'm like, and I was like, oh, she, maybe she's declining. And I'm a little worried about her because, you know, when I, you treat patients that get better, they just they don't see them anymore. <laughs> And then she's like, well, Dr. Hyman, I'm going trekking in Bhutan and I want to know what I should take and bring with me. I'm like, okay. I had another guy who, uh, again, was, was you know, the CEO of a big company and running his family business and, and really was, was pretty far gone. Uh, and he was sitting in a room, really cognitive, severely cognitively impaired, depressed, and his family, his kid, grandkids didn't want to be around him. And he wasn't able to function, don't have social events, nothing. Could have been running his company. And I said, well, just let's look under the hood. And he had, you know, not one thing. And often it's not one thing, it's many things. You know, in medicine, we're taught, oh, it's the one thing. It's this one pathway. This one drug will fix it. I'm like, it's amyloid. It's this, it's, it just doesn't work like that. The body's an ecosystem. So he had a whole series of things. He was very insulin resistant. Even though he was on overweight, he had a big belly, like a big like little pot belly. So he was very insulin resistant. 
He had extremely high levels of uh, homocysteine and had, had these methylation problems that we we're talking about. He also had the genes for it, this MTHFR gene. And he also had APOE double four, so he was at high risk because of this genetic risk. And then he had really high levels of heavy metals because he lived in Pittsburgh. And almost all my patients from Pittsburgh are heavy metal toxic because the US steel is there and they have use coal to run the steel plants and that coal goes in the atmosphere and it's everywhere. It's on the soil, it's in the, on the streets, it's everywhere. And so he had high levels and he had a whole mouthful of fillings. So we, 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 he had one of the highest levels of mercury I'd ever seen. We, we toxed him for mercury, we got his fillings out. We optimize his insulin, his methylation. We, he also had terrible gut issues. Now we know the microbiome plays a huge role in cognitive function in the brain. We know it declines as we age, but also we know it's a, it plays a role in dementia because of the inflammation and the leaky gut. And we know that Alzheimer's is a brain inflammation disease. So where's it coming from? It could be the heavy metals. It could be the methylation issues. It could be the insulin resistance, but also it's his gut. And he'd had irritable bowel for years. And was on, I think it was on Stelazine or something for his gut, which is a psychotic drug to calm his gut down. We fixed his gut, we fixed his insulin, we fixed his methylation, we fixed his metals, and he literally woke up like with Ben Winkle. It was really quite amazing. So I see, you know, case after case like this, and it just, it just gave me hope. Now, there are some patients I, I really have struggled with who are like, you know, we tried things and it's kind of a, maybe we haven't figured out the whole puzzle pieces yet, but, but I would say that, you know, eight out of 10, you know, either get significantly better or dramatically better. And, and, you know, so whether it's it's mold or lime or insulin resistance or heavy metal or the microbiome or often a whole collection of these things, you, you have to deal with all of them. It's not like the one thing. And like Dale talks about, it's, you know, if you have 36 holes in your roof, it, you know, if you plug up five of them, it's still going to rain in your house. So you got to find all the holes and you got to plug them all. Absolutely. This is so exciting. Um, absolutely, there's hope for people right now. There are ways to prevent and reverse cognitive decline. And yes, we always need to know more. We always want more research and more data. Yeah, yeah. Fair criticism. Um, we did a clinical trial in my office and uh, we're excited to share the results this year and publish those in a peer reviewed journal. And Dr. Bredesen also and his team did a, a trial and got similar numbers to what you're describing about yes. 80 percent of people get better. So we know yes. enough to act right now. We don't Absolutely. have to wait for more. And I no. love that a lot of this is just common sense, just uncommon yeah. practice. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the finger, and there's even major research trials like the finger trial was a trial that used lifestyle and dealing with all these different metabolic things and changing diet and lifestyle and saw not only a slowing, but a reversal of cognitive decline. And Richard Isaacson's work is really profound. And he's, you know, was, was a really, you know, extremely rigorous science around this and it's coming to the same conclusion. So all of us who are trying these things are coming to the same conclusions. And, you know, yes, there's always more to uncover. And I talked to Richard about other layers of things like heavy metals or things he might not be looking at, but even the simple stuff of just like fine tuning each person's unique biology, which is really what functional medicine is about. It's about understanding the imbalances in the body, correcting those imbalances by taking out the bad stuff and putting in the good stuff. The body can recover. It's really remarkable. We're built to heal. We're designed to heal. So what's next for you? You have taken on big projects. You've written many, many best-selling books. You've been involved with the Cleveland. I mean, your your resume, your CV is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't believe I'm still standing. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what what's next for you? How do how do we share this message more broadly so that it's more adopted by more people and there is less suffering? What is the, what's next? For me, what's next is, you know, I, I just finished writing a book called Young Forever, which is about taking the science of functional medicine and focusing on longevity and understanding how we activate all our innate healing systems, our longevity switches, and, and actually bringing that into sort of more of a common conversation about how people can do this on their own and also what's coming in the next science. So it's really kind of exciting. We're now, for the first time, I, 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 the way I talk about it is we're understanding the mind of God. How, how are we designed? How is the human body designed? How do we work with it in a way to enhance its function and optimizes performance. So that's kind of an exciting project. And, and the, the other thing I'm really working on a lot is the food system. And we sort of touched on it earlier, but how do we change the food system? Because if we don't do that, we're, we're kind of swimming upstream. And, and I think that's really a key focus of mine is how do we change food policies to change agriculture to create a more regenerative agricultural system to create a regenerative healthcare system. We're working on things like we talked about nutrition in medical schools on medically tailored meals. So Medicare will pay for food as medicine where we change and in, in fund agriculture transformations through regenerative agriculture. And it's starting to happen. And, you know, through the work we've done, we've literally gotten billions of dollars allocated 
for the USDA for regenerative agriculture. Uh, Secretary Vilsack just announced a food system transformation framework, which works on multiple levels to enhance the, the food as medicine framework and, and regenerative agriculture. Uh, we we're now gonna have a White House conference on nutrition and health, which hasn't happened in 50 years. That's gonna happen in September. So there's a lot of really exciting things happening that are coming out of our work and other people's work. It's obviously not just us, but we're just trying to move this down the field uh, collectively. And it's really quite exciting moment in history. I think we're like waking up to like, wait a minute, maybe there's another way to do this. Extremely exciting. So how can people help? I know our listeners are going to one, want to make different decisions after hearing this conversation. So is there something they can buy different in, in the grocery store? Sure. I mean, I think, I think, you know, all of us have the opportunity to vote with our dollars, with our forks, with our actual votes. And I think it matters. I think people feel disenfranchised, disconnected, but what I do doesn't matter, but it does. And it could be, you know, as simple as, you know, taking the initiative of, of composting or you know, creating a garden. I mean, 40% of the food in America during World War II was grown in victory gardens. We call them victory gardens because we needed to put people to work in factories to make air, you know, a bomber every 52 minutes, which we were great at doing. We can't even, I don't know what's going on with this country now, we can't even make enough masks for people. So it's like uh, the, the, the potential for us as individuals to make the small changes that make a big difference collectively are huge. And, and when we vote with our dollars, companies change. You know, I have a friend, for example, who uh, is on the sustainability board of Nestle, and they are working with the CEO of Nestle, which is the biggest food company in the world, to, to help them. And they have committed to do, by 2030, 70% of their supply chain is regenerative agriculture. That's huge. That's huge, because that's going to drive the market. That's going to drive agricultural change. And so I, I, see, I see these initiatives happening, and it's, it's really exciting to me. And then two, how can people get involved? Should they sign up for your newsletter? How can they find out more about you? Sure. I mean, if you can keep track of what we're doing you know, on social media, it's just Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Mark Hyman at, on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram uh, and TikTok, I think even. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then of course, uh, they can go to my website, drhyman.com. I've got a newsletter for recipes. I've got my podcast, The Doctor's Pharmacy, every week. We've got a couple of episodes. Uh, a week and that. And so there's ways for people to get connected. And, and also, if you want to join the movement to help change the food system, you know, po politicians don't lead, they follow. So if, 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 they, if they don't see a grassroots movement, if they don't see people interested who are voters uh, calling these issues out, and pushing this forward, they're, they're not going to change. So, so if you want to join, we're going to be activating our community through, through political action, which will be just made just just making comments on social media that we can then aggregate and collect and then share with the government. That's what the government's looking for, particularly with this White House conference, which is in September. So if you really want to help, sign up, sign up for uh, my social media account, sign up for my newsletter. We're going to be activating people and, and getting people to, to kind of call in uh, a change, which we can all do together. Uh, and I just want to sort of close with a, a quote from Margaret Mead, who said, you know, never doubt that a small group of of, of committed individuals can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. So I think, I think that's really what we need to think about. I and mean, we, we really can make those changes in difference. Incredible. Dr. Hyman, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today, share this message, so important, so critical to people's health individually and also all of us collectively. I'm so grateful to you for the work that you're doing in the world. Thank you so much, Heather. I appreciate being here. Have a wonderful day and um, Please sign up for that newsletter and take action where you can.